Okay, welcome everyone. We're really excited. I'm really excited to be teaming up with Rachel and letting you all hear about her expertise of growing in the classroom. This is her fourth, starting her fourth year growing in the classroom with her kids. So she really has a lot to share. And I have a lot of experience growing in my home and feeding my family. So I'm gonna share a little bit about that. Um, but I wanted to, I can sit here for 20 minutes and tell you what the tower garden is, or I can show you a three minute video that explains it beautifully with illustrations and, and gets straight to the point. So we'll, we'll do that now. Our aeroponic vertical garden system uses both water and air to produce more colorful, better tasting, and incredibly nutritious fruits, vegetables, and herbs. Tower Garden has a 20 gallon reservoir at its base that stores the Tower Tonic Nutrient Solution. Developed by experts in plant and human nutrition, Tower Tonic Mineral Blend enables superior plant growth and better nutrition from your Tower Garden produce. The process begins once the seedlings have been placed in your tower garden. Here they will be nourished with Tower Tonic Nutrient Solution. Inside the reservoir is a small, low wattage submersible pump. The pump pushes the nutrient solution up through the tower to the top. From there, the nutrient solution drips through the central tower using a special device that evenly cascades the solution over the exposed plant roots. On the journey down the tower, the nutrient solution feeds the roots and becomes highly oxygenated as it cascades gently down the reservoir. This process is continuous, providing fresh oxygen, water, and nutrients to the roots of the plants. This patented aeroponic process enables food crops to grow faster than they would in soil, so they can be harvested more often. And it makes Tower Garden a healthier, easier, smarter way to grow your produce. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. She's going to talk about growing in the classroom. So as uh, Tish said, this is my fourth year, and um, I get a lot of joy out of having the tower garden in my classroom. Um, when Tish came to me, something that stuck out was the first thing that she said to me, that we're raising kids to be consumers and not producers. And that is so true. Even my own self, I, I had not thought of myself as a consumer, but I definitely did, wasn't doing the job being a producer. And so having this in the classroom has made that easier for the kids to make that connection too. Um, so I just wanted to start by sharing just a couple different things that I use the Tower Garden to apply to my lessons. Because if you're an educator, you know that everything needs to apply to your curriculum or apply to what you're teaching the kids. So a couple of our, um, we just finished a lesson, a unit in science on the parts of a plant and um, how plants reproduce. And I was able to use um, the tower garden as a great example. I mean, we went as far as pulling the whole pot out and looking from roots all the way up. So it was a great hands-on experience for them to learn what they were learning in their textbooks, but also in real life. So the kids at Sacred Heart in my class, they start from seeds and they go all the way up. So it's really hands-on for them. This is a couple pictures of them um, getting to harvest. And we track growth, so that's another way you can use it to teach your kids. Um, so they've had a lot of fun. This picture is one of my favorites because it's um, fifth graders and second graders. So 
they were helping each other and teaching each other the safe ways to harvest. And then I'm not, I think this one is some kind of a herb that they're harvesting there. So, um, the Tower Garden also offers opportunities for lessons that aren't in your lesson plans. And that's my favorite thing about the Tower Garden. In this picture, um, one of the second graders grabbed the scissors and just was ready to cut and go to town. And the fifth grader stopped him and said, whoa, 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 before you start, let me show you how to hold your scissors properly. I'm like that's a lesson that wasn't in my lesson plan. So that was really neat for me to see that. Tower Garden has um, great resources and they're free lesson plans that can go along with your curriculum or lesson plans that if you have an extra 15 minutes a day, you can pull one up and it will totally, totally be an educational experience for your kids. So there's lots of good resources, lots of good free work resources on their website. This is a quick video. Hi, I'm Steve Rich, a teacher at Public School 55 here in the South Bronx. And I make a difference by growing food four stories up in my classroom. 365 days a year, right here in the South Bronx. Who wants to grow the butterhead lettuce? Me. Okay, so I became a teacher because it seemed like the right thing to do. And then I got big, the magic hit. Every day here is an opportunity to do something great, to change lives, to transform a community. This is a community that needs education. This is a community that needs motivation. This is a community that needs connections to bigger things. And we are the conduit for that. I'm not a science teacher by trade. I'm certainly not a farmer. Many years ago, someone sent me a box of daffodil bulbs and we hid it behind the radiator. And the heat and the steam from the radiator forced it and the kids saw this beautiful blooming thing of life. I had an epiphany. And that began the work of actually, you know, planting seeds. It planted seeds in my mind, and kids felt great. They felt wonderful, and I wanted to replicate that success. One, two, three, si, se, puede. We have a taco. Food is non-negotiable. We have children here who have never seen what real food is, and we also have kids here who have emigrated from other countries in search of food. We are 37% food insecure in this community. We have 40% unemployment in this community. 99% of the kids in this school qualify for free and reduced lunch. And to think that food is the entry point for public education, for reading, for writing, for literacy, for math, for aspiration and inspiration is incredible. But most importantly, by growing food, we're creating life. We're planting seeds. And that's what this is about. We are harvesting hope and cultivating minds. We need holes and plant the seeds. Then three days, it will grow and grow and grow. So this is a soilless system. Here's day three. Oh, and gee. And what we've been doing here is other classes. Mr. Steve, he's teaching us how it's natural. He taught us about pH, like it's bad and good. Then you can eat more healthy vegetables and food. We have 96% daily attendance. That's an opportunity for me to get in and get those little brains cooking. Retention is going up. Faculty involvement is going up. On Sunday, when I walk the street and kids are like, I can't wait to see you tomorrow, we've got thousands of residents out there looking at us from the projects with our classroom glowing in the middle of the night saying, what's going on in there? And that's exciting. We're creating awareness and excitement. Test the pH of what? Not everything. When you teach kids about nature, they learn to nurture. And when children learn to nurture, we as a society collectively embrace our better nature. He believes in the Bronx and he believes in the students of the Bronx and their potential. Any student he works with, he connects and keeps in contact. He is always thinking of them. Every day is an opportunity to do something great. My favorite crop is organically grown citizens, graduates, members of the middle class, <laughs> kids who are going to college, kids who are voting, kids who are staying out of jail. And now, here at an elementary school, we're finding it is easier to raise healthy children than fix broken men. And what could be more inspiring than that? Job creation program, family health program, cooking programs. The future is unlimited. Teaching kids to count is cool, but teaching them what counts is also critical. 
um, very much about ABCDs. This is also about asset-based community development. So we want to bring the walls as far out into the community as possible and bring the community as close. So if we can knock down stereotypes and bridge kids and bridge schools around things that are going to benefit the environment and the world as a whole, wow. Before the Tower Garden, I never would have known the different types of lettuce, let alone taught my kids that, but I use it now for vocabulary enrichment. My kids know what the word arugula means and how to spell it. You know, they would have never, I would have never thought of all the vocabulary just that we could take and use and apply in our classroom. So that is another thing that we've definitely benefited from the Tower Garden. It's great for not just what you learn in your science book, but you can apply it to lots of different and then the last thing that I'm going to talk about is funding. And there are three different types of funding. The first one is grants. And Tish has a printout for all of you if you're interested in grants. Um, we've been looking back and forth about what it takes to write grants. And some of them are a little long, but some of them are pretty reasonable. So if that's one way that you're planning on funding a tower garden for you or for your school, um, we have a few resources for that. The next one is community. And then the last one is parents. So community, obviously you can go out in your community and see if there's a business or um, like at Sacred Heart, parents that have businesses, reaching out to them and seeing if there's something that they can do to help us fund this. And then the last one is parents and just you know getting your parents together and who's interested in helping provide you know, healthy knowledge for our kids in our classroom. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Yep. Okay, so I want to kind of back up and talk a little bit about where the Tower Garden started, where it came from, <coughs> why it's so important to our community. So Tim Blank is the creator of Tower Garden, and his vision started he grew up in North Dakota, and he in a small farming community, and he loved science as well. And so when his family took a trip to Epcot, and he they rode the land, that land ride where they do all the aeroponic and hydroponic gardening, he immediately sparked like a love for horticulture in him. So he was in high school when that happened. He went back, went to the University of Valencia, got a degree in horticulture and then in 92 he started an internship with Walt Disney in the land ride and by the year 2000 he had worked his way up to head horticulturist for the land um, and in those early years of him working he worked really tightly with a lot of scientists like scientists from oh I was gonna so there's the land I keep forgetting to bump it and then in those early years, he worked with amazing scientists from NASA, from um, the FDA, learning how to grow more nutritious fruits and vegetables. So his knowledge was limitless. Um, in, 19, oh, in 2000, he left Walt Disney and started his own company called Future Growing, and that's where he started to develop growing systems, and that's where he came up with the Tower Garden. Um, in about 2012, he sold that patent to the Juice Plus company, and they started marketing it as the Tower Garden. And then in 2016, he came back to Juice Plus and is now one of our chief engineers with our company. So he also still has his future growing company, but he works for our company as well. So it's awesome to have him on board. He has such an innovative mind for growing the most nutritious fruits and vegetables out there. Okay, so it truly is the future for urban gardening. It really is. We have less space, less water, and this just makes the most sense, right? We're growing up, we're using less water, and it's 100% successful. It really is quite easy to grow on a tower garden. Thank you. 
Well, I skipped the pictures of me and my kids. I got, you want to backtrack? Yeah, I got tap, I got tap happy. They're too cute to skip. I know. So, when my family started a health journey in the fall of 2014, I realized I was buying a lot more fruits and vegetables from the grocery store. And the second thing I realized is how expensive they were. And so when I learned about the Tower Garden, I immediately realized I needed to have one. And we had tried gardening years before that, and it was a miserable flop. We, we didn't know what we were doing. It was a whole lot of work. They do look awfully cute planting that garden. But um, we spent hours watering, weeding. We, our soil was not right. We had no idea how to prepare our soil. So we got very little yield from that garden with all of that effort, all of that time, all of that work. And so the tower garden made a lot more sense to us. So I was super excited about it whenever I found out uh, that I could grow it in my home year-round, all my leafy greens and herbs and fruits and vegetables. So my first year was truly successful. I started in May of 2015 when I bought my first tower garden, and I grew the whole summer growing all kinds of produce, tomatoes, cucumbers, all my leafy greens, my kale, green beans, um, eggplant, I grew everything you could think of, anything besides a root vegetable. And then once it got cold out, I brought it inside and I grew through the winter with the grow lights. So one of the first things I realized, right, is that I was saving money by growing on the tower garden. It was, it really was saving me money. The amount of produce that I was buying within what I was having to cut back out at the store so I loved that I was able to save all of that money and I knew that the produce that I was putting on their plates was actually more nutritious than what I was buying at the grocery store. Okay, so here in the US, and especially here in Kansas, a lot of our produce is shipped in, right? Railways, roadways, airways, boats. 20% of our produce is actually shipped in from overseas. So it comes thousands and thousands of miles to get to us. And so one of the things um, I think that is, we know that whenever we're growing our own fruits and vegetables, that it's guaranteed to be fresh, right? The produce that's coming from overseas definitely is not fresh by the time it gets to our plate. So this kind of illustrates, it shows how healthy are the vegetables that you're eating. So whenever we are putting fruits and vegetables onto our plate, that are commercially grown, many of those fruits and vegetables can be off the vine for weeks before it actually hits our plates. And it's the whole time that it's off the vine, it's losing nutrition. So it's a process that's called oxidation. So the second that a piece of live, right, it's alive when it's on the vine, the second that you harvest it, that plant is now dead. And as soon as it is dead, it's, it's gonna start oxidizing. And through the process of oxidation, it's losing nutrition. And so we want to eat our fruits and vegetables as soon as after harvest as possible. So in some cases, we're losing up to 45% of the nutrition just from the time that it's harvested to the time that it hits our plate. That's pretty substantial. You know, we, if we're gonna eat those stupid green beans, we want them to be really nutritious, right? So, <laughs> okay. So E. coli, salmonella, listeria, these are a few things that are a root cause of fruits and vegetables being recalled from the produce section, right? So I know we talked about that 20% that's shipped in from overseas, only 2% of that produce is actually inspected. So this is where a lot of those recalls are coming in, that it's just fruits and vegetables that aren't getting inspected and we're getting really nasty bugs and, and infestations on those fruits and vegetables. So we know that whenever we're growing our own produce, that those fruits and vegetables are not gonna get recalled, right? We know exactly what's happened to all of that produce. Okay, so commercially grown produce often lacks nutrients. So we talked about how the time between when it's harvested to the time it hits our plates that it's losing nutrition.
but it's also there's another key factor into it being less nutritious to begin with. So since 1950, the veg fruits and vegetables that we're putting on our plate today are automatically less nutritious. And there's a couple of reasons for that. In some cases, up to almost 40% less nutritious than vitamin C. There's a couple of reasons for that. Partially, it's environmental. We're talking about soil, the, the, the density of the soil, the nutrition that's in the soil. And then we're using more pesticide or fertilizers, more irrigation systems. And this is to help grow our produce faster and, and more of it. But what we're lacking then, whenever it's growing that fast, is that we're lacking in nutrition. And then second of all, it's um, the genetic dilution effect. So that we're, we're genetically picking plants that are specifically grown to grow faster, to produce more, but that's often at the, at the effect of losing nutrition as well. So we have two key elements there. Okay, so pesticides. We control what goes on and what, what goes in and on what we grow. So I know that I, I have three towers now at home personally, and I know that whenever I'm growing them, I can, I can choose that I'm gonna grow completely organic. And so I, I use zero pesticides on my towers. Um, does that mean that I never have a pest issue? No, that does not mean I never have a pest issue. But, the, but eliminating soil from the whole process, you're greatly reducing the chances of bringing in pests, of bringing in molds, of, of that kind of thing. But for instance, um, this spring I mail ordered some seedlings and I got aphids on my tower and they were devastating my tower. And so um, one of the, there's a couple of options you have when you have aphids. You can completely clean out your tower and start over because they are nasty little bees or you can use pesticides, right? Which I wasn't willing to do. But I just, I, try, I decided I was gonna try an organic approach and I mail ordered 3,000 ladybugs from Amazon and released them on my tower and those, those little boogers took out those aphids and I didn't have another problem the rest of the summer. And I wish I would have added that video on here because that would have been really cool to show. Um, but it was really neat to watch them just they immediately started eating the aphids and got rid of them. So, um, but you know, a lot of our commercially grown vegetables obviously have pesticides on them. And I know here in Ottawa, Kansas, the number of organically grown vegetables that we have, that we have available to us in our grocery store is pretty limited. The quality is limited and, and the variety is limited. So, I know that I can grow myself a wide variety, but also when I start to look at what is put on those, those fruits and vegetables, like strawberries are known to have 20 different pesticides, 40, 40 different pesticides on strawberries, and celery up to 60. Cucumbers, 86 different pesticides are known to be used on cucumbers grown commercially. So yuck, who wants to, you can't even feel good about putting cucumbers on your kids' plates right, with all those pesticides on there. So um, this gives me a lot of peace of mind knowing that when I put a cucumber on my kid's plate that I've grown, there's absolutely no chemicals on it. Okay, so now kind of, we've talked about how I grow in my home, but the community garden aspect, you know, where Stephen Ritz is talking about how he is starting to see a change in his school and the different things that we can do in the community to use the tower garden or community gardens of some sort. So some of the aspects are big um, greenhouses, big community gardens, but rooftop gardening I think is really something in urban areas that's so important because that's wasted space. That's space that's not being used for anything else. And a rooftop garden literally makes a city greener, not just from the appearance, but when you have a bare rooftop, it absorbs heat and then bounces it back, which actually increases the amount of energy that you have to use in your community, which actually leads to dirtier air. So by having a greener community, you really are giving back to um, a whole big movement of 
saving the community as a whole. Um, so those are just some things that we are doing. There is actually a huge um, greenhouse in Scissor Tail. It's called Scissor Tail Farms. It's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They have 26,000 square feet greenhouse and they are growing, a, a, I mean, it's huge. And they are showing, um, they are using that produce to give back to their community, which I think is phenomenal. Okay, some of the reasons that urban gardening is so important, and I feel pretty passionately about it, is um, that four in five Americans live in cities and suburbs of cities. 16 million American kids don't have enough to eat. And only 2% of American children eat enough fruits and vegetables. So we need seven to 13 servings of fresh fruits and vegetables in our diets every single day. And only 2% of our children are getting that. So that's, in my mind, that's leading to health issues down the road as adults. So these are little things, if we start to think about putting gardens into communities, what we can do to help promote better health in our children. Okay, so to finish it up, I'm going to use a little quote from Benjamin Franklin. Tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, but involve me and I learn. That's it. Thank you. I think I have, oh, I do have, you can stop the recording though. Um, there are order forms up here for school order forms. There's certain